All right, it's one o'clock. What's going on? I'm your host, Hugo Fernandez, here on LaGuardia Web Radio. And my guests today are, let me pull this up and get it right, are Emily Duran, a preventionist and a community educator slash program coordinator for Mount Sinai Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Program, and Nathan Tosh, a program coordinator of the Women's Center and LGBTQIA Safe Zone Hub here at LaGuardia Community College. And uh, we're going to be talking about October's National Domestic Violence Prevention Month, services that are available at the college for students, staff, and faculty. Welcome. Thanks so much for having us, Hugo. Sure. And I got to tell you, I started with Annie DeFranco, which, you know, was interesting to find. Mike's wife was a big Annie DeFranco fan. And, you know, when you look up songs to deal with you know domestic violence prevention uh you know it was actually what i what i would find i don't know if that song worked but i like annie defranco <laughs> i put her on i had some alanis morissette but it didn't quite it wasn't quite jiving yeah i can see that <laughs> are you uh, are, are you muted nathan by the way because yeah, there know, we go i don't know if you've been were you even trying to say things? No, no, I've right? just been here vibing out. Okay. Well, both of you are our guests, returning guests. You've been on the show before, but I wanted to give you two an opportunity to say, you know, uh, to introduce yourselves again for the audience. If some people are watching you, or seeing you for the first time, uh, we want to just talk a little bit about the, the things you do here on campus. Sure, I guess I can go first. So, um, hi, my name is uh, Nathan Tosh. Um, as Hugo mentioned, I'm the program coordinator for the Women's Center and the LGBTQIA Safe Zone Hub here at LaGuardia Community College. Um, do a lot of programming, a lot of events, um, a lot of training. Um, our center is really focused on supporting uh, students who identify as either women or LGBTQIA+. However, we offer services for all students, faculty, and staff throughout the campus. Um, we've been doing a lot more of mental health support lately through our support circles, as well as um, education through um, different trainings, such as our Safe Zone trainings and Safe Zone workshops that are available for faculty and staff if you want them for your department or for your classes. Emily? Awesome, Nathan. Um, my name's Emily. Like Hugo said, I use she pronouns, and I'm one of the program coordinators and community educators for the Mount Sinai Savvy program or the Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Program. Um, and we offer a couple different services. Um, so we offer trauma-informed counseling to folks who've experienced sexual assault, intimate partner violence, stalking, or human trafficking. We also do emergency department advocacy at SAVI, where we support folks um, who go to the ED um, who've experienced sexual assault or intimate partner violence. And then there's the outreach training and education team, which is the team I'm a part of. Um, and we provide presentations on all things violence prevention. Um, we have a series going with uh, Nathan this uh, month. Um, and we, you know, talk about, um, you know, what does domestic violence look like, um, along with a lot of other topics. But um, we've also started doing office hours um, on uh, from Savvy uh, with all of our campuses. So that's where folks can come to us. And if they have a question about how do I set a boundary or how do I, um, I don't know, put on a condom or where can I go find this counseling service, um, we are available to help um, via those sort of office hours. We call it the Savvy Education Corner. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about what we're doing on campus. So for this particular month, with the focus being on domestic violence prevention, I want to get that right because I think when we've talked in the past, I, I, I made it out as if you know we were talking about domestic violence, but it's, we're not talking about the, the prevention. Uh, how do we go about this? How are we how are we going about uh, dealing with this issue as it applies to our campus populations? I, one of the first things I think that we're doing is um, we do have the recurring series that um, Emily and I partner up with um, just about every semester at this point, um, which is called Building Safer Relationships and Community. Um, we generally do this every October, which, um, as we mentioned, is 
um, Domestic Violence Prevention Month. And then we also work generally in April, which is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, so many of these issues are um, brought up again, um, oftentimes for um, faculty, staff, and students. It's often knowing your rights, knowing what um, resources that you have available, um, being able to ask questions in a non-judgmental space. Um, I think what's really important about the work that we're doing is both Emily and I are non-mandated reporters. Um, so students are allowed to come into spaces like the Women's Center, the LGBTQ's I escape zone, come to Emily and ask some of these more intimate questions, ask um, things around like personal experience and actually see like what resources were available to them um, rather than possibly saying it to maybe somebody who works in um, the office of like labor affairs and like then having to then make a Title IX report as a result of it. Um, I'm not sure, Emily, if there's anything you wanna add on to that. Yeah, Nathan, I think you um, summarized it pretty well. I think that I would just add that, um, you know, there's sort of two, a couple sides to prevention, right? There's the response end where we're helping folks um, get access to resources so that they can get that equitable access to their education. Um, we're helping them get the services they need if they've been experiencing this or they're currently experiencing this. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that we could talk about that, you know, faculty and staff can do to support students. Um, but Nathan, I appreciate you brought up the confidentiality aspect of what we're doing. Um, and then the other component, uh, like Nathan said, is sort of that education piece. So um, not only are we, you know, pre preventing stuff from happening again to someone, um, but hopefully through series like this, um, we're preventing stuff from ever happening to folks. We know that the most common age that folks experience intimate partner violence or domestic violence is between the ages of 18 and 25 and that somewhere around one in three um, people in general, um, regardless of gender, gender, will experience some form of physical violence by the time they reach the age of 25. So we think that this is a really great and unique opportunity to connect with folks um, to hopefully um, you know, prevent this from ever happening. What kind of response have you gotten from uh, students, staff, faculty, as far as taking advantage of these services? I think it's been pretty good so far. Um, we were trying to do in person at first, um, and we've switched to a virtual format. I think we're getting a few more folks with that. Um, there have also been a couple of uh, breaks, um, like class breaks uh, recently. So um, the folks who do attend, though, they seem to get a lot out of it. Everyone who's attended um, has said, I want to come back for the next one. Um, so I think it's overwhelmingly positive. I think a lot of folks come in, um, you know, thinking like, I don't know, everyone seems to be so open that I've worked with. Um, I don't know, Nathan, if you want to, yeah, I would, to add. To I was going to say, so um, for just like a reminder of what our series is doing, right now we're doing a series. Um, again, we moved, as Emily mentioned, online for this semester. We did the first uh, session in person, um, but it fell on, um, I believe Rosh Hashanah and um, people who attended said they would prefer going online. Sorry, my light just turned off. Um, there we go. Um, but um, many of the people who um, participated on our second session said online seems to be the best. We also get like a cross CUNY um, collaboration with this. Um, so our series is shared with the uh, Women's Center Council and the um, LGBTQI um, Council for our CUNY LGBTQI Council. So members from outside of, of or outside of LaGuardia are attending these events and learning what is available to them. Um, I think our two biggest populations is that we have LaGuardia and then York College attending these pretty regularly. Um, but fairly regularly, we'll have faculty, staff, students um, either stop um, at stay by at the end of the training to like ask Emily a follow up question ensure that they're getting like the additional contact. Um, we've also had um, faculty staff members who have like stayed and they've asked like, hey, this was actually kind of interesting. We want to do a training related to, you know, maybe more around Title IX or maybe more around like mandated reporters and like they'll then work with Emily to continue on the process um, and making sure that like some of these events that maybe feel more student focused are also still getting resources to faculty and staff. As a faculty member, I'm a non-mandated reporter, right? 
So typically at LaGuardia, if you do not know if you are a mandated reporter or not, you are probably a mandated no, reporter. No. Um, you are a mandated reporter? Yes. Yes. Uh, typically, you are explicitly told if you are not a mandated reporter. From what I understand at LaGuardia, our non-mandated reporters are a small handful of professors. Um, so I believe somebody like Chelsea Del Rio, who runs like Lavender LaGuardia and does like reproductive justice events, she would be a non-mandated reporter. But explicitly, um, the Women's Center and the LGBTQIA Safe Zone Hub are non-mandated reporting spaces. Um, and the Wellness Center is a non-mandated reporting space. So if a student goes for counseling, and they, you know, mentioned like that they've been assaulted. Um, the counseling center does not have to go out and report that. It's or the wellness center does not have to go out and report that either. Um, but best assume if you do not know that you are a mandated reporter. So if I were to become aware that either a student in my class or a colleague at the college was the victim. Of domestic violence be my what would be my next step so the next step would be to reach out to the title nine coordinator um who you um the interim coordinator was sabine um and now it is craig green um i think maybe nathan is putting that information in the chat um you would send an email to the title nine email Nathan, I'm not sure if you have that on hand. I don't have it off the top of my head um, saying, here's what I found out. Um, if you know any names of the people involved, um, you would share that information as well. Um, the way that I try to, um, because we know that mandated reporting can be, you know, re-traumatizing for folks. If they come to you, they trusted you, and they didn't realize you were a mandated reporter, and now you have to make this report, right? There's a couple of things we can say to that student, like, thank you so much for trusting me enough to tell me. And then letting them know that they have the right to, whenever you go and make that report, whenever you send that email to Craig, you can say, you do not have to respond to whatever email Craig sends you, right? You do not have to go to a meeting if you don't want to, but you can if you think it would be helpful, right? There's different resources, um, different measures, um, called interim measures or informal measures um, that students can get to receive equal access to their education. So things like academic accommodations, do you want, do you need um, more class absences? Do you need extensions on papers? Maybe they can get a no contact order um, issued on campus, um, things like that that might be helpful for folks. Um, that might not even um, require that they go through a full Title IX process. So, um, yeah, next step is sending an email and also letting the student know, like, you support them, you believe them, and they do not have to do anything with this, right? Right. <laughs> Nathan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say, generally with um, doing Title IX support, as Emily mentioned, a lot of times it's around getting uh, additional, um, I guess, sort of like, benefits um, through have, or like additional accommodations through the process. So as Emily mentioned, you can get um, the different, you know, maybe you need to take a medical leave of absence. Maybe you need like, like more excused absences. You can't do that without doing the Title IX um, work. Um, many students are unable to do that if they are, are a part of this process and refuse to speak to a Title IX coordinator. But I do think it's important to know that like, if they don't want to report to Title IX, um, they can still get resources on campus. So like if they want to use like the wellness center and they need counseling, um, that is still an option for them. Um, it just limits the number of accommodations that they are able to get. I will just add on to that a little bit, Nathan, that we can get a little bit creative though, if folks don't want to go to Title IX. Um, I've seen folks go to a, a counseling center or go to a psychologist and get a PTSD diagnosis. Then they go to their disability services office and get academic accommodations that way. So we may not be able to get something like a no contact order, um, but if someone just needs those academic sort of accommodations, um, that can be one helpful way to go about it. Yeah, I guess it, get, it gets quite complicated because the no contact order, you know, typically security gets involved, right? And can be aware of, let's say, whoever the, the violent partner is and I, 
I have heard stories of students who, so you've got two students now engaged in this, or, uh, or the student is the offender, and the report is made, and that can be, you know, the, the, the denying them access to the campus uh, could be imposed, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if that happens before or after the the investigation is completed as to whether, you know, the the allegations are bounded. Uh, I did hear, I don't know if it's because I've, I've had dealings through the central office, you know, affairs committee, the board of trustees, and that's called student life. Sometimes we will hear cases and things are brought up. It's pretty complicated. It's a pretty tough uh, thing to uh, put into place, right? Yeah, those can definitely be diff tricky. Um, and it depends on, you know, what the case is. So do they have the same class? Um, sometimes a Title IX coordinator can help um, have the faculty member create an independent study for the student who's causing harm. Um, they are required to do something like that um, if a no contact order is issued. Um, I, we did discover at one of our first workshops, um, because we had uh, the Title IX coordinator come, that you know, it, it's not so cut and dry for extracurricular activities. Um, so ultimately, the Title IX coordinator would encourage um, the director of that activity to encourage the student causing harm to go to a different extracurricular, but they cannot like require that technically. Um, so that can get pretty um, interesting. But yeah, it does get a little bit difficult, especially in a place like New York City where we're campus is in the middle of the city, you know, if it's someone who's, if it happened with someone who's not on campus, um, you know, they can still go and make the Title IX report, like it would still count, but it does kind of get tricky to enforce. And if you wanted to weigh in on this, Nathan. I was gonna say, I think Emily really kind of covered it there, um, but it does get, as Emily mentioned, it does get um, a lot more complicated when you're in more extracurricular activities as opposed to classrooms. Um, so again, if like a student is involved with like um, the STEM club, for example, not saying that it was in the STEM club, um, but like the faculty liaison for the STEM club would have to make the executive decision or decide maybe like they recommend somebody goes to a different club. Um, that's where it seems to be the most complicated for um, Title IX reporting. So we, you were talking a little bit about uh, what goes on in your sessions, and it sounds like uh, a lot of times you're talking to people who are victims, right, or have been victimized in this kind of domestic violence. Uh, so as far as prevention, pretty, you know, how do we get ahead of it uh, before people find themselves victims, or is it typically the case that we're going to be dealing with folks who have been victimized to some degree or another, and now are really looking at uh, preventing it from happening in the future? So I would say it's a combination of both because I do think that to some degree, you know, these workshops are optional. So the people who opt in are attracted to them for a reason, right? There's um, maybe there's something that's gone on in the past. That's not always true. Um, but I would say that, you know, these are meant to sort of teach people new skills um, so anyone can benefit from that, whether they've experienced intimate partner violence already or not. Um, I would say that the way that I go about, um, teaching these, um, I try to take some approaches from the CDC, which says that teaching folks about healthy sexuality, um, and he healthy sexual behaviors, um, can be really, um, one of the key preventative measures that we can take at least in terms of the work that I can do. Of course, there's things like housing justice, economic justice, and things like that. But for things that I can do, um, that's sort of what I try to teach about. I try to keep, teach concrete skills when we're in those workshops. So I think um, the other week we did one on um, Relationships 101 and how do we lead with values. And then we talked through <clears throat> how do we set a boundary with a partner I was like, all right, so here are some formulas that you can use if you need to use them. If you don't feel like you need to use them, you don't have to, but you take what speaks to you, right? 
um, yesterday, Nathan was yesterday's consent, um, I think, and we talked about what are the literal steps to consent. And then I think that for me, you know, part of my job is to change a culture around consent um, and shift from a, like a culture that revolves around enabling sexual violence and intimate partner violence to a culture that is centered in consent and bodily autonomy and things like that. So I always assume that most of the people who attend my workshops are not necessarily going to be the ones causing the harm, right? So we want to teach folks skills that speak to them. Um, so in this consent workshop yesterday, um, I talked about like, how do we know that we want to engage in sexual activity? What feeling comes up for us? How does that show up in our bodies? Okay, what do we do with that feeling now, right? Um, Nathan, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add, but that's just one example that comes to mind. Yeah, I was gonna say, and I think it is um, back to like Hugo's original question. Um, I think, as Emily mentioned, like we are attracting like a very specific audience. None of these um, trainings are particularly mandatory, um, but um, they're attracting a specific group of students. But whether we're helping students who have experienced um, domestic violence, sexual assault at one point in their past, or if they are just learning that skills because like maybe they're part of a vulnerable population and they want to know what's out there. I think all of those are successes, um, especially even if we're talking with students who have maybe been um, victimized in the past. Um, there's a pretty recurring trend that like, if you have been a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, that you will re-experience it again at a higher rate. Um, so it's important to like remember skills around the different ways that like we can make sure that we have body autonomy, our body autonomy, and making sure that like we are in control um, of what we are doing in any given situation, how we are able to say no, what lines of consent really are, um, and making sure that like we're aware of like what populations are a little bit more vulnerable. Um, I think something that I always find interesting whenever um, or these presentations is for college students, the group that experiences um, sexual assault at the highest rate are seniors, um, which is I think often the opposite of what you would think. I think you would generally ex expect maybe like freshmen to experience at the highest rate, but it's seniors and like LGBTQIA people experience at this at a tremendously higher rate, specifically trans um, people. And like making sure that like students who are part of vulnerable populations are aware of what can happen and the resources around it and how to navigate these situations when they come up and how to prevent them right then and there. Um, that feels like some of the most important work um, whether they've been um, a victim of sexual silence or domestic abuse in the past or not. How are students finding out about these services? I mean, I get a lot of emails. Please share with students. I get at least one a day. Uh, and now I'm teaching six classes, believe it or not. So I have to, I share it in one Blackboard and I have to share it in the other, you know, copy it for the other five. That's the way I, I pass on information. Uh, but Howard students classically being uh, finding you. So I would say, um, think for LaGuardia specifically, we have um, one I think is great is that um, Dima and I are both quite involved with the first year seminar process. So like Dima does the different support circles. I do the different workshops throughout different first year seminar um, courses. So if there's any professors listening, um, if you need anything in your first year seminar or first year seminar, let us know. Um, we're happy to provide services and it gets students connected to um, our spaces. Um, I found that um, recently I did a number of safe zone workshops in um, an English class and there were a number of students in there who were wanting to maybe like explore LGBT topics, but like did not know a thing. Like maybe they heard a gay person exist and that was about where their um, knowledge had ended. And like just being able to come into these spaces and be open and like answer some of these honest questions because like sometimes you get like just like honest questions around like a topic and like it could literally be like I don't identify as queer but I want to use like they them pronouns is that appropriate and like they just never had the space to ask that and like it's a it's a fair question but you don't know who to ask that to and now you have somebody that you feel comfortable asking so we'll get students who are involved 
through like those and they feel comfortable talking with like myself or Dima and then being able to bring them to other activities. Um, we also will post things through our, um, through the LaGuardia events calendar. We'll post things through Instagram. Um, we're get, starting to build like a stronger relationship with our marketing communications team. So we're gonna have like a more concentrated campus update, which feels um, really important. Um, so I'm really happy for uh, the work that Manny and his team are doing now, where everything will sort of just be like collected in one easy to read email once a week. Um, and we'll be able to like push events to a lot of people through a lot easier means. Um, but that seems to be the, our strategy. Um, I'm not sure if Emily wants to talk about what how they promote throughout Mount Sinai. I, I'm going to let Emily sit, do that, but I just want to take advantage. It's 129. Uh, the show is what's going on here on LaGuardia Web Radio. Uh, I'm your host, Hugo Fernandez, and my guests today are Emily Durand, a preventionist and community educator slash program coordinator, Mount Sinai Sexual Assault and Violence Prevention Program. And Nathan Tosh, Program Coordinator of the Women's Center and LGBTQIA Safe Zone Hub at the Gordon Community College. And we're talking about October's National Domestic Violence Prevention Month and services available at the college for students, staff, and faculty. So, uh, Emily, do you want to have an opportunity to talk about the same question? How can people find you? Yeah, so I think Nathan covered it. A lot of times we're partnering with folks on the college campuses to get the word out. Um, but I do want to use this as an opportunity to announce that we do have a Savvy um, Education Team newsletter called the Savvy Guide. Um, we just launched it in September um, and I can share a link to that in the chat in just a minute. But on that uh, newsletter, you'll find everything from we talk about community events, savvy sponsored events, and then we talk about college specific events. So like this workshop series, um, we also talk about office hours. Um, we started a program um, for any faculty listening called Don't Cancel That Class, um, where folks can schedule us to give a workshop if, instead of them canceling class for that day. Um, and we also do a resource highlight on that um, newsletter. So. Um, well, I think this past week, uh, month, we introduced um, a guide to um, accessing food in New York City, because we know that there's all these intersections with intimate partner violence and food access and economic justice and things like that. So um, we're trying to use it as kind of a catch all. But if folks want to find out more information, um, they should sign up and hopefully we can add those links into maybe the description somewhere. I think we will when we send out our links and when we make it available through the uh, the different archives that we have, make it there. But I don't know if Chris can share the link for Craig Green uh, on the on the Twitch uh, or anything else you can share in the chat as well. Because I don't I don't know if, it, if the chat that we have, I don't think the chat that we have here on Skype uh, has any relationship to the chat on Twitch. Uh, I'm a first year seminar. I'm teaching five first year seminar classes. And the first thing I want to do is I want to do like a fine search on my uh, on my syllabus about LGBTQIA plus, uh, you know, where it falls in my in the weeks, because, you know, typically I mean, three of them are one hour courses where, where it's basically all, I, all the time I have is to just kind of go over a lot of the things at the college. But then there, you know, I have a couple of their three hour courses or tie in things about uh, fine art. Student, fine art students need to know these classes uh, of the fine arts major uh, and do maybe get some fine arts activities. But uh, if so, if I was to invite you to my first year seminar, what would you do? Yeah, so um, for the Women's Center and the LGBTQIA Safe Zone Hub, I guess it really depends if you're work, looking more for the support circles. So um, again, we run support circles, which are sort of like wellness based um, circles where students can come together and like talk about like the things that are going around. And DEMA tends to run those, but our Safe Zone workshop um, tends to um, focus around um, LGBTQIA topics, vocabulary, laws, um, and important language. Um, so 
like we'll go over like some really basic laws that are really important for anybody, um, especially here at LaGuardia and Sony of our students are coming here to like enter the workforce to change careers. I'll do like a quick rundown of like some of our newer uh, laws that we have here in New York, like uh, the GRA, which is the Gender Recognition Act, or GENDA, which is the um, Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act, which has a lot more precedence. And we're now first starting to see like the results of like cases of um, individuals who've been discriminated against. Um, so especially for people who are just entering the workforce, it's important to know like, hey, if somebody comes to me and they say, I wanna be called by this name, I wanna use, you know, she, her pronouns, I wanna use they, them pronouns, whatever it is, legally we have like an obligation to respect that. Um, and if we are ab adamantly choosing not to respect that, there are consequences um, and these will often lose you your job because like um, from what I've been seeing, every case has been around $20,000. Um, so if you're working and you're working through college, you're working at 7-Eleven, if they get one of those cases, your job's gone. Like they would rather lose you and not have to pay another $20,000. Um, so it's really important to do that. But then it's also just like responding with, you know, care to students who are LGBTQ, understanding like, hey, here's like the proper language to make sure that like we're addressing people properly and giving like students again, like that honest space to ask questions. Because like, if a student is just like, who, who are they them? And like, I can explain like what a pronoun is and like, how like it doesn't necessarily fall to like a specific group of people, but like, here's how you use it. And like, here's an easy way of like, if you're tr struggling with like, I've never used this pronoun before, how do I use it? And like, I'll work through like those sorts of conversations, answer any questions. Um, it feels important being both gay and trans to be able to come into a space and be able to like explain, you know, a little bit about like who I am, but like give you like that non-judgmental space to be like, you know, I've heard like this term transsexual, what does it mean? And like, can I use it? And it's like, here's like the context of like what this term is and like, how do we evolve and how we evolve from there. Um, but that's typically what I do. And it tends to last 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how active the class is. Emily, do you, do you go to first year seminars as well? You know, I haven't, but I would love to. <laughs> We, what would you do if you if you had a group of uh, ideally we're, we're talking about students who are in their first year at LaGuardia they ideally they would take the class in their first semester but mm -hmm. that's not always the case yeah we would probably do um, something similar to what we do um, on other campuses with student orientation so we have a 30 to 60 minute long presentation that's all about empowering us by um, letting folks know what their rights are. Um, I try to make it a little bit fun with a Kahoot game, um, which tends to get people pretty interested. It's a game where people can like, I do all true false questions. You don't have to do it that way. Um, and you actually, Nathan, I don't think this one is true false. Um, I have one that's all true false, but um, you answer questions online in the classroom and or you can do it virtually as well. And um, people like get pretty competitive about it. They track your score. You're supposed to answer as quickly and accurately as possible. But in that we talk about, okay, what is Title IX? What is enough is enough or Article 129B in New York State? We talk about consent a little bit um, and some definitions. We talk through some statistics so that we can kind of undo some of the myths we might have um and yeah and then we do the game at the end um so that's probably what i would do with a group of first year students um because it's pretty intimidating to come into a room and be like oh we're going to talk about sexual assault or domestic violence but it's a little bit uh less intimidating i think to sort of gamify it and, and make it into something a little bit more fun I, every time Nathan's on, somehow it, the this pronouns issue comes up for me. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, you can you can the, the continuing adventures of Professor Hugo, uh, where I had there's actually like the, the one hour classes. I I do have an activity in the beginning where people are encouraged to share their how they want to be uh, referred to as far as pronouns are concerned. And, uh, but in the, interestingly enough, and a lot of times these first year seminar courses are actually courses that are taught 
by others. They've shared their syllabi with me, and I teach them infrequently, to be honest, because there are some people who, who classically teach these classes for us, and I'm just kind of stepping in this semester. But I had one episode in the class, my first year seminar with the with the with the uh, uh, artists, the artist folks. I was referring to. I had one student who, you know, they have one name listed on the attendance. Then I uh, had an, uh, an experience of where they wanted to be referred to in a, with a different name, and then. I used a pronoun class and another student who I guess had had they, I guess they're close they they bonded you know kind of vehemently corrected me and said you know I think it, whatever it was you know whatever the pr pronoun that that person wanted to be referred to and you know I said oh, okay got it you know, and struggled with its usage as you know getting used to uh, pronoun be, becoming very conscious of it. But this is, it, it, I've been watching this develop over time as an issue. And it's interesting because I have, you know, friends, colleagues, even in uh, other states like Florida, for example, where we know there's a lot of issues going on in Florida, right? Uh, around the, but they're not, and they're not embracing it. And while it's here, again, like I said, it's, uh, you know, I have folks who, it's almost like a militant, a strident uh, kind of uh, in, uh, demand. That I quickly get up to speed with the policy. So, uh, is this something you're experiencing throughout the college? I was going to say, Nathan, don't you have an exercise that you do with folks to learn? Yeah, I was going to say, I guess responding a little bit to Hugo. So, I am originally from Florida. Um, so, I'm like a. So am I. Yeah. So, I <laughs> uh, grew up in Central Florida. I'm from Mississippi. So, <laughs> um, so excuse me. Uh, I grew up in like the central Florida area, and I think it's one, a unique space being in higher education. Um, I think there's a lot more protections in higher ed spaces compared to where like maybe you would have in the street in Florida um, or, you know, in public schools right now, like we have like the whole don't take a bill in Florida where like you can't support LGBT students if like they come out as gay. I think you even have to like report it to their parents, um, which feels insane to me. But like in higher ed spaces, like the college that I went to and like many other universities, they have like specific non-discrimination acts that encompass many of the same things that like we have legal protections for here in New York. Um, most of the legal protections generally fall around name and then the three most common pronouns, there's plenty more. Um, so like the he, him, she, her, they, them. Um, and then most of them don't include like the neo pronouns. So like we have the Z, Z, Rs, Zem years. There's basically one for every letter of the alphabet. Um, they were born out of like 90s feminist thought. Um, but like they're not used tremendously often. I think I've met maybe like three people being trans and being in a lot of trans spaces. Like you just don't see many people using them. Um, but if you do come across somebody who um, the pronouns are hard to get, my practice is, has always been um, this was something that I started with like my education friends and like it really seemed to stick is you write like a paragraph and this can be like a simple paragraph and use like the person's name for the first sentence and then use their pronouns for like four or five more sentences. And it could be like really simple stuff. So like you start with the person's name and like whatever pronouns your head automatically assumes. So like you see me, and you might be like, Nathan likes, or Nathan goes to the store. He likes chocolate. He buys a taco bar. His favorite taco bar is X, you know, like whatever it is, you make that up. And then you rewrite that same paragraph five times with the pronouns that they want to use, you'll get it like that. Um, and that seems to be like a really, like writing it down constantly seems to be a really vibrant practice of like just committing it to memory. Um, but again, back, I think to your point about just like people being more, I guess, assertive with the sort of pronoun use. It's something I've noticed a lot more in higher ed spaces just in general. Um, it's, it's a space where students really get to explore themselves, be themselves for the first time. Um, I think they often feel a lot less judgment than maybe they did in high school or maybe they did in middle school and like also a lot less judgment that they're going to feel out in like the rest of the world. It's a space where they get to really figure themselves out. If they want to like try on that different hat and be like, I want to try being like non-binary, even if that hat doesn't stick. If they have like that feeling of like gender feels off, it's the time to really question it and do it in a safe space 
And I think like that's what's really important because there are the protections around non-discrimination. They get to use whatever name they feel the most comfortable with. They don't have to go through like the legal name change process to like be called how, whatever they feel comfortable with. And I think that sort of makes like a breeding ground where they get to explore themselves a little bit more. And like, yeah, sometimes that's like maybe like a faculty or staff member, you're going to get like that harsher student who like, you know. All right, folks, sorry, uh, excuse the technical difficulty. My engineer, Mr. Pope, uh, his computer crashed and we believe we were both recording and streaming on Twitch uh, just before we lost contact I would I had been asking the question since we've got about 15 minutes left uh asking Emily and Nathan uh what are some of the last they want to share with us concerning uh domestic violence prevention month yeah so I was just thinking maybe we could talk about some of the rest of the workshops that we're offering this month um yes let's so uh, next Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m. This is all going to be virtual. We have two left in October. Um, the next one will be all about bystander intervention. So how do we interrupt violence in our communities? Um, and what are some specific strategies we can use um, to do that? Um, and then on the 25th, uh, we'll have our What's So Scary About Ghosting workshop on rejection. Um, which I think is maybe our most popular workshop. Um, we unpack what is ghosting, what's the difference between just setting a boundary because you feel unsafe, and what is ghosting on its own. Um, and then we talk about, okay, what do we do if we've been rejected or experienced rejection? How do we process our feelings around that? And then how can we also reject other people um, in a way that feels safe for us? Um, so that's what's coming up and then i think um in theory uh we're planning a sexual health series in november um so more to come on that but nathan do you have anything you want to add yeah i was gonna say i would say just continue on with um if you haven't attended already um and maybe if you're interested but you want something a little bit lighter i think that's why so many people attend the what's so scary about ghosting um, seminar, but like um, what I always find so helpful about that one in particular, all of them are really terrific, but like this one gives us sort of like a common ground that like so many people who are probably a bit younger, more on like the dating apps have experienced a lot more. It gives like a very easy entry point um, of maybe these aren't the students who are like super, you know, interested in like learning about Title IX, but like everybody who's like on a dating app even with like friends nowadays, like they're experiencing ghosting and like setting up boundaries, but also learning how to like prevent being like coerced into something feels like very important. Um, I remember talking very specifically about like coercion around like um, sexual assault in our last time that we did this session. And like, that was something that like has stuck with me and like even just like shaped the way that like I would talk with like friends or, um, you know, family members around like maybe what they're experiencing um, and like, I think the work that Emily specifically is doing feels just like really important. And this one is like a very approachable one. Um, but the bystander intervention one, I know um, is something that Title IX has like, is really pushing forward towards um, as well. Um, this is a very important session if you um, are able to make the one um, next Tuesday at one o'clock. It's um, probably one of the most informative ones that we do throughout this entire session. Um, it really dives into like how do we interrupt violence within our communities and making sure that we're focused not just even on ourselves but like how do we help our communities at large and sort of like change the culture around us it, this is really the 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 bystander issue right the fact that in most in most of these cases where someone is the victim of domestic violence there are people who know and may or may not know what to do and this is kind of the if we let just much much like, the, like bullying in the workplace or bullying in general uh, this idea the vice the, the importance of people getting involved or aware of what's going on and but most people don't know what to do in those situations they're caught off guard right yeah so we try to like unpack like okay even if some a situation feels intimidating or like maybe where we have anxiety or people are just unsure um, 
we like to say that there's a strategy for everyone, right? So a lot of times people go to this idea, oh, I just have to be direct, um, which I will say is generally the most um, research shows it's taken the most well by the folks experiencing the harm and the person causing the harm if someone intervenes directly. But there's like all these other options. So we can create a distraction. We can, um, what are the other five Ds? We can delay. So we also advocate that going up and providing support to someone after something has happened is also just as important as intervening beforehand. Um, so I give the example that one time I was in New Jersey um, trying to get on New Jersey Transit and I was there was one other person on the platform and some guy drove by in a white van and just stared that person down. And I was like and then she turned to me and she was like are you okay or like wasn't that weird like was that weird did I just see that and I was like yeah that was really weird and I was like how do you feel about standing together until the train comes it doesn't have to be super like I don't have to run up to the van and be like what is going like you know so things like that there's a there's an option for everyone so hopefully um if folks come to the workshop um it's an opportunity to think through those strategies before we have to use them Thank yeah you. and it gives us a lot of options I think it's often intimidating, especially if like we're seeing like, as Emily mentioned, maybe these more random acts of like, sort of like these instances, maybe like you're on the train and like somebody is like harassing somebody, somebody is doing something that like you feel is inappropriate, but like maybe you don't want to approach this like larger person who maybe is instigating some kind of harm. It gives you the option of like, what if I spill my coffee and like create a distraction through that. Um, what options do I have to like call for help afterwards? But that way we also don't have the situation where like we feel like we're in a crowd of people. We live in a busy city. Maybe we just don't have to do anything about it because somebody else is going to do something about it. Because research has shown if we like really feel like, you know, somebody else is going to do something about it. We and we don't. Everybody sort of feels the same way. We don't want instances to be going on where we are all assuming that other people are going to prevent harm and then we don't actually end up preventing any of the harm. All right, fight against that 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 part of ourselves as New Yorkers to uh, kind of not pay attention and, and move on. Uh, we're almost out of time, so I don't know if there's any any last things you'd like to share. Anybody you want to any shout outs or uh, you know again give us dates and times for upcoming events. Sure. Um, as um, Emily mentioned before, we have two more sessions. Um, they are all going to be held via Zoom. Um, they are from 1 to 2 on Tuesdays, um, so 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Zoom on Tuesdays. Um, if you want to get more connected to the Women's Center or the LGBTQIA Safe Zone Hub, feel free to email us. Um, you can just Google LaGuardia and then Women's Center or Safe Zone, and it'll show our email. We also have um, an Instagram if you want to follow us. Um, you can also like DM us any questions. We are at L-A-G-C-C-W-C hub, H-U-B. Um, so just find us on Instagram. You can DS, DM us a question around our series, around any events coming up, anything that you want to, and we will happily answer. And I'll hand it over to Emily to and anything that she would like to share. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, um, like Nathan said, come to the last two workshops for October. Um, we also have that newsletter if you'd like to sign up there, um, and we are planning to put that in on our Instagram uh, link tree as well. Our Instagram page is Mount Sinai Savvy, um, S-A-V-I, um, so you can follow us there to stay up to date. We send reminders out about events what we can, um, and oh, and then we also have the office hours opportunity as well. Um, I think the newsletter is the best way to stay up to date with all of that information. Um, so I highly recommend that. Well, I just want to thank the two of you for being on again, and thank you for all the important work you're doing, which is it's, uh, it's important work. It's tough work uh, to do, and uh, hopefully that uh, our students will take advantage of it, and our, and our faculty and, and staff. So uh, the show is What's Going On. I'm your host, Hugo Fernandez, uh, and 
today my guests have been Emily Durand, preventionist and community educator slash program coordinator Mount Sinai Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Program, and Nathan Tosh, uh, the program coordinator of the Women's Center and LGBTQIA Safe Zone Hub here at LaGuardia Community College. Uh, we've been talking about October's National Domestic Violence Prevention Month and the services that are available at the college for students, staff, and faculty. Thank you two for being on, and uh, thanks for those folks who've watched and listened. And hopefully, we'll take advantage of these services pass the word on we're in this work together right and we'll close the show as uh, we began with my uh, engineer mr pope taking us out with a little bit of annie defranco thanks for watching thanks for listening <laughs>